Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation today to have me speak uh, here at Rural Roots. Uh, my name is Dane Elmquist. I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Idaho in the Department of Entomology, Plant Pathology, and Nematology. My major advisor and co-author on this presentation is Sanford Agenbrode. And today we're going to talk about soil arthropods and soil health, getting to know our below ground partners in Pacific Northwest wheat systems. All right, so I just wanna give a brief outline of uh, the presentation today. Um, we're gonna to start with an introduction to the soil arthropod fauna. Um, and then most of what we're gonna do is just take a look at uh, some creature highlights, um, highlighting this fascinating group of organisms. Um, I've got some great videos to share with you all. And then we'll round things out, um, talking a little bit about some of my PhD research um, focusing on looking at different agricultural management practices that uh, promote these soil arthropod communities in ag systems. Um, you see this soil arthropod zoo on here. Unfortunately, um, we're not going to be able to get to that today. I actually do keep live colonies of these soil arthropods um, here at our laboratory. Um, and I was hoping to be able to share some of those with you with a microscope um, camera, but I'm not able to get that to uh, talk to my computer currently. So um, we'll just have to uh, spend some more time maybe with some questions. <clears throat> All right, so we'll get going here. So I've got soil health in the uh, title of the presentation, and this is a you know, pretty popular, somewhat loaded term that we're hearing a lot about today. And I've got a couple different definitions on the screen here. Um, this first one is from the USDA, and it's a pretty long, wordy definition. I, I won't read through it. Um, I wanna rather focus on the, the second definition um, of soil health that we've got here on the screen, which is, you know, we should allow the soil to work for us and not work against us. Um, this seems like a, a pretty, pretty simple um, definition. And I'm hoping that uh, by the end of this presentation, I've convinced you that soil arthropods are a critical part of what helps the soil work for us. All right, so. Jumping in right away. So soils, soils are alive. As many of you all know, um, they are home to every kingdom of life on the planet, ranging from viruses, bacteria, fungi, all the way up to some of the larger mammals, right? Like uh, maybe voles and moles, things like that. Um, you don't see those pictured here on the screen today. Um, soil arthropods are a really large component of soil biodiversity. So there's about 1.5 million species um, that have been described. And of those described species, 23% of them spend all or most of the, uh, all or some, excuse me, all or some of their life in the soil. And of that 23%, 85% of those are arthropods. And so they're this really large, diverse group. Um, and they're very important in contributing to ecosystem services in natural and managed systems. Um, However, compared to some of their other counterparts that live in the soil, like earthworms and microbial communities, as well as nematodes to a certain extent, they don't really get as much attention and they're relatively under, it's a relatively understudied group. And I think this is a, um, you know, a, a big gap in our knowledge is, is what we know about soil arthropods. And so I think it's a, a really important group to, to study and learn more about. And that's uh, basically has been the focus of my PhD research here at the University of Idaho um, for the last uh, four years. So we're gonna talk about soil arthropods today, of course, and a lot of the um, data, as well as the pictures of the critters that I'm gonna share with you were all collected from agricultural systems in our region. So here we just see a, a map um, highlighting some of our sampling sites where we've conducted various um, experiments or in some cases actually on-farm studies, um, just to illustrate that we've done a fair amount of sampling in this region um, in multiple different locations. And this is actually kind of the, the it is the first ever um, Kind of look at these communities, the first ever sampling effort that's, that's been uh, undertaken to, to try to learn more about soil arthropods and agricultural systems. So it's a, it's a nice um, set of data set um, that's going to hopefully serve as a, a baseline for monitoring changes in these communities over time. 
All right, so diving right into it. So this, uh, this pie graph here is basically showing a, a rough outline of what the soil arthropod communities of Palouse farms are, are like. Um, these are, again, based off of all of our sampling um, that you saw from those sites on the previous slide. And this includes over 900 community samples, uh, 120,000 uh, plus arthropods counted, and over 70 different taxa identified. That's a very nice visual you have there. Yeah, thank you. And it's, uh, it's a really big data set too. So it's, uh, it's a really good, again, um, data that serves as a baseline for monitoring changes in these communities mm -hmm. over time. And like, uh, like many, um, most soil arthropod communities, our soil arthropod communities are dominated by springtails, also called columbola, and mites. Hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more about these guys uh, as we move through the presentation, but they make up about 80, 85 percent of the arthropods that we, uh, that we sampled so far. Other really important insects or prevalent insects that we sampled from agricultural systems include bark lice, um, or, uh, and these guys are decomposers. They're living in leaf litter on the surface of the soil, breaking down, comminuting litter, increasing that surface area, which helps microbes uh, come in and um, improve the quality of litter for nutrient cycle. Uh, thrips were another big, um, it's kind of surprising soil mm. arthropod. We don't always think of them as soil arthropods. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, beetles were another really prevalent group and beetles are important because they include many different functional groups like predators as well as decomposers. Um, and beetles were the third most abundant insect that we, um, that we were able to collect from our community sampling. Some other soil arthropods that maybe are a little bit less familiar to folks out there um, include two-pronged bristletails. These are small, um, fast-moving arthropods that live in the soil, um, act as decomposers and predators. So again, they're, they're um, providing a lot of different functions in the soil. Um, and then there are also these, uh, these small um, arthropods called protura, or uh, their common name is the coneheads. Uh, these were not extremely common in our, in our samples, but again, I just wanted to highlight them here because they are a... Uh, a soil arthropod and they may not be familiar to, to a lot of folks. Um, so again, this is a, a, a large data set that we've collected and hopefully it can uh, serve as a good baseline for monitoring changes in these communities over time because this was the first time um, anybody's really gone out and looked to see you know, who, who's actually out there in our soils. Hmm. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we how we talk about how we categorize soil arthropods, and there's there's primarily two main ways. The first is by size; um, they fall into groups called the mesofauna and the macrofauna. And then the second way we talk about arthropods or think about their categorization is by functional groups, which I alluded to earlier, um, and that just basically means you know what they eat. Um, you can see here this example. This is a uh, predatory mite here eating a springtail. So this would be an example of a predator functional group. All right, so let's talk a little bit about size. Um, as I mentioned, soil arthropods are categorized as the mesofauna and macrofauna. And we, we categorize them based off of their body width. So mesofauna are animals that have a body width greater than 0.1 millimeters, but less than two millimeters. So again, these things are uh, like springtails, mites, those two-pronged bristletails, pseudoscorpions are another example of a mesofauna soil arthropod. And then we get up into uh, the macrofauna as well, which include uh, animals that have a body width greater than two millimeters. So things like beetles, wireworms, um, and earthworms would also, although they're technically not arthropods, earthworms would also fall into the category of macrofauna. And when we think about uh, these less body width of less than 0 0.1 millimeters, these are things that are the, the microfauna, um, things like soil microbial communities, bacteria, fungi, as well as nematodes would fall into that, that uh, size category. And thinking about size is relevant because the arthropod size, as well as the structure of the soil is going to influence their interactions, right? So it's really the interactions between arthropods, between arthropods and their food source like fungi that are um, 
driving a lot of these ecosystem services like decomposition, and nutrient cycling. And the soil structure is really important in influencing these interactions. And so when we're thinking about like management practices, um, practices that encourage a, a wide range in pore size um, are really important to, to maximize the potential for these different e interactions that are fueling um, ecosystem services that are, are taking place in the soil. So you can imagine if you had a um, soil that was heavily compacted, um, really reducing the uh, pore space that is available for these interactions to occur, um, you might lose out on some of the ecosystem services that these soil arthropods are providing. So thinking about arthropod size as well as soil structure is, uh, is really, um, really important. All right, so now moving on to talking about categorizing soil arthropods as uh, func different functional groups. Um, so as I mentioned, these functional group interactions are really what's driving ecosystem processes in the soil. I've got this kind of complicated food web um, here to the left, but basically we're going to just talk about um, three main functional groups, the herbivores, predators, as well as the microbe eaters and decomposers. And I'm going to go through here and share some pictures and some fun facts and videos mm -hmm. about uh, members of each of these different groups. And all of the critters that we're going to highlight here are actually from the uh, soil arthropod communities collected from the agricultural systems here um, in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not like anything that's uh, you know, found in the, in the tropics or anything. These things are, are right outside our back door. So let's, uh, let's take a look at herbivores first. Um, I'm just highlighting a couple uh, herbivores here that were especially um, either prevalent in our samples or um, economically important to producers here in the Palouse. Um, so the first one I'm gonna highlight here are called garden centipedes or some phylons. Um, garden centipede is a little bit of a misnomer because these guys are not technically centipedes, although they're related to centipedes and millipedes. They're in that sim same group um, of myriapods. Um, and these symphylins were the most abundant myriapod that we were collected that we collected in our samples. Um, occasionally, we would pull out a soil core and extract the communities from them, and there would be, um, you know, 50 or 60 of these guys in just a two liter soil sample. So they can be really prevalent. Um, and they are herbivores, they do feed on fine roots and seeds, and they can reach pest status at uh, really high densities if they're not controlled by other predators in the soil. Um, fortunately for us, um, throughout all of our sampling, we really didn't ever find them at these um, high densities that would um, confer pest status to them. So they're, they're more of a, um, uh, not really a pest in, in our ag systems. Um, they are, they can be pests in like vegetable growing systems. So if you have like a small um, scale, like organic vegetable farm, um, you know, these guys could uh, potentially be pests, but in our um, cereal, you know, large cereal systems, they, they don't really reach um, pest status at all. So um, talk about pests, uh, moving over to the wireworm. Uh, Elateridae. So these guys are um, pretty well known to, to a lot of producers here on the Palouse as they're pests of cereal grain crops. Um, one thing that might be uh, positive news is out of all of our sampling, those over 120,000 arthropods that we've collected, wireworms represented less than 1% of all the individuals collected and only 4% of the total herbivore functional groups collect, that, we, that we collected. So um, while they, they are pests, um, we, we did not actually find them in, in large numbers throughout all of our sampling in uh, numerous cereal crops um, over the past four years. So, you know, maybe that, that might be considered a, a good thing, depending on, uh, you know, what you're growing and, and who you are. So I'm going to share a, just a quick video here, um, just of a symphylin here in action. So this is a, uh, a YouTube video, again, huh. of a, a garden centipede. Um, and this is actually the, the same species that we have here um, on the Palouse. So you can kind of see it's, it's got a similar morphology to, to centipedes and millipedes. Um, you know, this is the head right here with the antennae. You can see that there are legs on each segment here, as well as two, um, sorry, moving around a little bit, two of these, uh, protruding um, appendages on its backside here. So we can get that back in focus. 
they're always white, they're always eyeless. Um, and this just is representative of their, their habitat, you know, living uh, below the ground. That's a yeah, nice there's video. Those, there's those appendages that I was trying to point out there, those right on the back, kind of those two, two pointy uh, appendages off the posterior there. So that's a, yeah, that's a symphylon again, and that's the same species that we have um, here, here in the inland Pacific Northwest. So I'll move on here to our, uh, our next group. Um, yeah, thrips. So I wanted to talk about thrips for a second because when I first started out uh, this project, you know, knowing a little bit about thrips as foliar pests, I really never expected them to find them in our soil arthropod samples. However, they were in fact the most hmm. abundant soil arthropod herbivore that we collected throughout all of our sampling. And looking into this a little bit more, um, I've got the life cycle of thrips up here on the screen. And you can see that right before they are going to turn into an adult, they actually will drop off the plant and spend this time um, basically turning into adult in the soil. And so this is actually, you know, um, one area where they can be targeted for potential biological control um, because there's lots of predators in the soil. So the thrips, when they drop into this, uh, the soil during this portion of their life cycle, they're at a really vulnerable stage. So again, um, having a solid uh, predator community um, in agricultural systems may help uh, give the potential for biological control of thrips during this um, vulnerable stage of their life cycle. So a little bit of a surprise to me to see these guys in our soil samples so much, but looking at the life cycle, it, uh, it definitely makes sense that they would be there. All right, so moving on to, uh, to predators, our next functional group, predators. These are some of my favorite guys. Um, here we're looking at uh, two predatory mites. Um, the predatory mites are a really large portion of the soil arthropods that we uh, sample from agricultural systems. And I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about a couple um, important uh, groups here. So the first one we're gonna talk about are the snout mites or the prostigmata. Um, you can tell they're uh, called snout mites because of this, uh, you know, snout that uh, is formed here um, on the, the front of their head. And these are actually the mouth parts that are chelicerate. So they will actually rub these guys together. Um, and that's how they will uh, pierce the, the skin of, uh, or the cuticle of some of their prey. And so these guys have really fascinating hunting and feeding styles. And again, they're an important part of uh, conservation biological control program. And I'm gonna just show a quick video here of some predatory mites, snout mites, consuming a columbola. So you can see here that snout is uh, penetrating the integument of this springtail. Um, and basically what they're doing now is they're injecting a kind of nasty cocktail of different enzymes and saliva into this springtail. And they're basically turning it into a smoothie on the inside. So they're smoothifying it. And then they're, uh, they're sucking the, the smoothie uh, of the, what is now the columbola out. Um, and so there are multiple you know, mites feeding on this columbola. And I really like showing these videos because um, you know, these, are, these are the interactions that are occurring in the soil underneath our feet even though we don't see them, um, it's a really active place. And, and this, is, this is some of uh, the stuff that's happening down there. Um, so yeah, some snout mites feeding and you know, potentially competing with each other for this, uh, this springtail resource. Yeah, that's a very interesting video of that. Yeah, these are, uh, these are some of my favorite, uh, favorite hmm. mites that we, uh, that we get out in our uh, ag systems. All right, and I mentioned that they uh, had some pretty fascinating hunting styles, so I wanted to highlight um, another kind of fun fact about these guys. Um, what we're looking at here is a scanning electron micrograph of what's called the silk capture mechanism. So mites are um, arachnids, similar to spiders. They have the potential to produce silk, and these guys will actually produce silk out of their snouts that wow. they can actually shoot um, at a potential prey to, to capture it. And then they use these, uh, these raptorial pedipelps is what they're called. They're part of the mouth parts, raptorial pedipelps to, you know, go and finish the job. 
turn it into a smoothie and, uh, and have a meal. So again, some fascinating hunting and feeding styles that occur down there in the soil where we might never think that these things are occurring. All right, and uh, this next video, I'm actually gonna jump back here really quick. So next I wanna talk about these other predatory mites that are called uh, the mesostigmata. Um, I kind of think of these guys as the wolves of the soil. Um, these were the most abundant natural enemy or predator that we recovered from our soil arthropod sampling. Um, and again, they're an important part of conservation and biological control programs. And these guys are readily identified by these forward facing legs, which they use to capture prey. And I'm gonna just share a quick video of them um, running around <laughs> basically. So this is a, a video of these predatory mesostigmatic mites. You can see those front legs uh, pointed out in front of their body there. Um, and what we're looking at here, actually this uh, kind of moving goop is a, uh, is a pile of nematodes. Um, so these guys are predatory mites. They eat arthropods, but they also eat nematodes and they can consume um, thousands and thousands of nematodes. So they can be important in terms of, uh, you know, helping um, promote suppressive soils and potentially um, eating pathogenic nematodes that we don't want in our systems. So again, they're like the wolves of the soil, I, I consider them. They're fast, they're voracious. And here's another video of uh, a mite that's captured a, a springtail. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that springtail is about to, to meet its last moments here and that mite's gonna have a, a meal. All right, so moving on to some other predators. Um, I'd like to highlight some of these, uh, these beetle predators that were relatively common in our soil arthropod communities. The first one I want to talk about here is the softwing flower beetle or Meliridae. Um, this is a picture of the larvae. Um, these larvae live in the soil. They're generalist predators, which means they're not really picky about what they eat. So they're eating all sorts of things. Uh, again, very important part of a conservation, potential conservation biological control program. And what's neat about these guys is they're predatory across multiple life stages, um, both above and below ground. So below ground, they're predators as larvae, and above ground, they're predators as the, um, these colops beetles, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, these guys are predators uh, as adults, as well as larvae. And um, so yeah, you're kind of getting the best of both worlds, this potential for biological control in the soil, as well as on your beet plants. So rove beetles or staphylinids, they were another, uh, uh, very abundant beetle predator, again, important for conservation, biological control potential. And they're also predatory across multiple life stages, but they primarily remain in the soil. So they're predatory as larvae, as well as adults. Um, this is a picture of an adult. And then here's a picture of a larvae. Mm -hmm. um, and you can really see the uh, predatory nature of these guys by looking at their really sharp mandibles that they use for, for prey capture. All right, now moving on to, to talking about uh, another functional group. Um, these guys are the most abundant functional group that we recover from our soil arthropod communities. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a few critters here because they're, they're kind of cool. Um, and some of them, like this duff millipede, may not be uh, familiar to, to many folks. Um, so the first group we're going to talk about are the orobatid mites or the box mites. Um, these were the most abundant mites that we recovered from our soil arthropod communities. We would sometimes pull out our soil cores, extract them, and there would be um, hundreds and hundreds of these mites. I think the, um, the number one um, most abundant species in a single sample were these orobatid mites, and it was over a thousand individuals in one two, thousand, uh, two liter soil core. So they can get into really, really high numbers in the soil. Um, and they're very important functionally. They're really important decomposers, nutrient cyclers, and they have really long life cycles. Um, and I like to highlight, you know, this fun fact, um, they're called box mites because they exhibit this behavior called tichoidy in which they tuck themselves beneath their armor and basically look like this. So you can, uh, you can kind of see this mite has basically taken its legs, taken its head, folded up into this armored ball here. So this is the head, um, just for some reference. Um, and yeah, if you're a predator uh, or something trying to go after this mite, you know, this is a pretty good defense mechanism, um, especially if you're in the soil, you know, where you can't readily run away. Um, being able to turn yourself into a, an armored shell is a, a pretty good way to avoid being eaten. 
So duff millipedes are another uh, decomposer that we find out in the uh, soil arthropod communities and the ag systems here in the Palouse. Um, they're not very common, nowhere near as common as orobatid mites, but I like to highlight them just because they're kind of an interesting critter. So these guys are fungus eaters, um, feeding on fungi in the soil, breaking up and liberating um, the nutrients that those microbial communities kind of take away um, and liberating those nutrients so that they are then available for plants. Um, these guys are recognized by these distinct hair tufts um, that you can see here protruding from the abdomen. So they are millipedes. Um, however, they really don't look anything like our, our traditional millipede, right? And um, these hairs that we see here are, are defensive. So again, if um, something is uh, potentially going to eat or prey upon these duff millipedes, they have the ability to um, have these irritating hairs that um, essentially will uh, cause a predator to, to either give up or occasionally, um, as you can see, these hairs back here on the posterior end um, can be like eaten or taken and removed from the millipede and then they can, you know, scurry away to safety. Um, so it's kind of a, a fake out, so to speak, for a, for a predator that might be attacking them. So kind of an interesting critter that we find out in the, in the soil, but they're not too common. All right, so moving on to another very important group. Again, these guys are still in the microbe eater decomposer functional group. These are the springtails or the columbola. Um, again, these were outside of the mites. These were the second most abundant um, arthropods that we recover from soil, our soil arthropod community sampling. Um, and they have many different forms, which kind of corresponds to their different functions and where we actually find them in the soil profile. And I'll just quick point out that they're called springtails because they have this unique uh, appendage um, called the furcula. And we'll take a, uh, this is the jumping organ. Um, and we'll take a look at a video here that shows this in action um, in just one second. But I wanna just quick go back to the uh, different forms and different functions idea here. So you can kind of tell I've got these three different springtail pictures on the, uh, on the screen here. And you might guess that, you know, this, this springtail here, this white eyeless, you know, no pigmentation, this is a springtail that lives deep in the soil profile. Whereas this uh, springtail up here that has eyes, has some hairs, is pigmented, um, has a very developed furcula, these guys are actually living on top of the soil. So these springtails are really abundant and they live in different areas within the soil, which kind of corresponds to, to what they're actually doing in the ecosystem. All right, so here's a, a pretty neat video um, of springtails in action. Can you hear that uh, narration in the video? Okay. No, I no can't problem. hear nothing. No problem. So basically what, uh, what this guy is saying is that this is a, a springtail um, springing at 50,000 frames per second. So this is really, really slowed down. Um, and I'll just kind of narrate along here when we get back to it. So you can see this is the furcula right here. Um, and basically what happens is when the springtail is um, threatened or needs to, to get away from a potential predator, it will actually unhook this furcula, which it keeps basically attached to the abdomen. And this furcula will hit the ground with some extreme speed, which sends the springtail flying. Um, so it's a really good way to, to get away from potential predators. That's, um, a, that's a nice slow motion version of that. Yeah, yeah, this is a really great YouTube video or YouTube channel. It's called Ant Lab um, for people that are interested. They have a lot of um, slow mo videos of fan fascinating different insect behaviors. So, highly encourage you to check that out. But uh, yeah, they got some really nice, uh, nice pictures of the springtails. Okay, so I just want to again kind of go back here and highlight a couple of these, uh, these critters. Um, so, first, looking at the uh, this springtail group, they're called onychurids. Um, these guys are white, eyeless. They don't have this furcula that we just saw. Um, they don't need it because they actually live so deep in the soil and in these tiny little soil crevices and soil pores that they really have no use for a furcula. So they've actually lost it um, adaptively. And these guys are microbe eaters. They primarily feed on fungi. They can feed on AMF. Um, and again, they live deeper in the soil profile. And because they don't have this furcula, 
um, to get away from predators, they've evolved a different kind of defense, a chemical defense actually. And so they will actually exude a toxin when they are, um, when they're disturbed or something's coming up behind them, perhaps in the soil, uh, soil pore, they'll actually exude a toxin from glands on their backs here that they uh, will deter predators. Um, so it's this chemical defense instead of a physical defense, so to speak. And so uh, the next group I want to talk about here are the entomobryids or the elongate springtails. Um, these are the guys that we just saw in that video. Um, these have eyes, as you can see right here, this long uh, developed furcula, and they're pigmented and they have some nice hairs on their body. These guys are detritivores. They live on the soil surface. They're primarily eating um, leaf litter, um, bacteria that are growing on the litter, breaking down, comminuting the litter, um, and increasing the surface area of litter that um, enhances the ability for microbial uh, communities to colonize and then break it down even further. And so these guys are the largest springtails that we uh, that we get around here. Um, you know, they're, they're still pretty small, but you can actually see them with the naked eye. Um, you can fit maybe, you know, 10 on your, uh, on your thumbnail. They're, they're that big. Um, sorry, here, going back too fast. So uh, the last group I want to talk about here are the hypogasturids. Um, these guys are kind of in between the entomobreids and the onocurids in terms of where they're living in the soil profile. Um, they have eyes. They have some pigmentation, but they have a pretty small furcula because they're not really using it to jump around too much compared to say like the entomobreids. Um, these guys again are detritivores and microbe eaters breaking down that litter on the soil surface, incorporating it back into the soil um, and encouraging nutrient cycling. These guys can actually often be found in, in really large aggregations too. All right, so we talked a lot about leaf litter breakdown, decomposers. Um, and I just want to give you an example of really how important arthropods are to the decomposition process. Uh, microbes are really responsible for, you know, ultimately carrying out these biogeochemical transformations, but microbes really, or excuse me, arthropods really make their job um, a lot easier and actually increase the rate of decomposition. Um, so that's a, a reason why they're really important um, in our soil systems. And I'm just going to share a video that basically um, shows that a lot better than I can say it. So I'm just gonna fast forward up a little bit here. All right, so basically what we're looking at here is 15 weeks of decomposition in 20 seconds. Wow. The panel on the left is decomposition um, in the absence of soil arthropods and other soil fauna, so just microbes. And the panel on the right is the uh, decomposition in the presence of soil fauna um, as well as microbes. So just take a look. So you can really see that, that increased rate of decomposition when arthropods are present in the system. Um, you can see, you know, things are starting to break down here on the left side, but um, really it's those, those columbola and those other arthropods that are really encouraging um, nutrient cycling um, and decomposition efficiency. That's very impressive. Yeah, that's a really, really great video. Um, I think it, it, yeah, if you want to know why arthropods are important in 15 yeah. seconds, that's, that's really the video to watch. All right, so now I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit here um, and talk a little bit uh, just about some of the research that we've conduct, been conducting here um, and, and different avenues that uh, growers, producers, people can take for managing soil arthropod communities. So as I, I hope I've convinced you guys that soil arthropods through all these different functional groups are really key players in the soil ecosystem. Um, and so one thing that, you know, we've been asking and we're interested in, in investigating is, you know, what, what types of agricultural management practices can conserve and promote soil arthropod communities as well as their functions, just like we saw in that video, um, that decomposition video. And one thing um, that's, uh, you know, um, people are getting interested in, uh, producers are getting interested in here on the Palouse are, are cover crops. Um, using cover crops as a way to suppress weeds, as a way to combat um, compaction. Um, so we wanted to ask, well, okay, so if people are starting to use cover crops, how do those cover crops affect soil arthropod communities? And we kind of approached this um, a couple different ways. Um, 
we asked, you know, if people are using cover crops, well, does the diversity of those cover crops matter? Is a more diverse group, a more diverse mix of cover crops better than say a monoculture? Um, and how does that impact our soil arthropod communities? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a couple of soil arthropod metrics that we use to, to measure how different cover cropping practices affect um, these soil communities. One of them is density and abundance. And this is really just the number of individuals per area or volume. In our case, we're talking about the number of individuals in 2000, or excuse me, two liters mm -hmm. of soil. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the size of the samples that we would go out and take and extract our communities from. Um, the next uh, metric I'm going to discuss here is diversity. And this basically is the abundance and the evenness of the different species that are present in a community. And I think diversity is a, a really important thing to, to think about and is, and is somewhat desirable from a ecosystem service perspective because it, it, uh, you can think about it like an insurance policy, right? If you have a diverse group of soil arthropods that are um, accomplishing all these different functions, if there is uh, you know, some type of management practice or you know, environmental event that, that takes out one group that's doing um, a certain function, if you have a diverse group of uh, our diverse community of soil arthropods, there's another um, arthropod that's ready to, to step up and fill in that role um, again, providing this kind of resiliency to the ecosystem. All right, so let's talk about cover crop diversity. So we were interested in understanding how diversity above ground in terms of cover crops affects diversity below ground. And so to get at this question, we set up a small plot study um, in Pullman, looking at six different cover crop treatments, uh, fallow control, where we just didn't grow anything, uh, pea, clover, sunflower, and flax monoculture cover crops, as well as a polyculture or a four species mix of all of these different monocultures. Again, asking the question, does the diversity of cover crops above ground affect diversity below ground? And here are uh, some of these results. Um, so long story short, uh, we did see a trend mm. in above ground diversity um, increasing the below ground diversity of all these three different functional groups that we just discussed. Um, however, when we start to look at these data a little bit closer, I think some kind of interesting patterns start to emerge. Um, so just to kind of orient ourselves here quick, we're looking at this, uh, this y-axis here is gonna be the diversity of our different functional groups. In this case here, we're looking at herbivores, predators, and these microbe, uh, microbe eaters and decomposers. And then on the x-axis here, we're looking at the number of different species um, in our cover crop. So zero is the fallow, the one is all of those monocultures, and the four is this polyculture mix. And again, we see this kind of increasing trend moving from zero to four in terms of um, promoting the biodiversity of soil arthropod communities. But when we take a closer look at these data, like for example, our predator we actually don't see any significant benefit moving from zero to one species of cover crops in terms of um, the effects of the biodiversity of our predator functional groups. You really need that multi-species polyculture cover crop to see a significant increase in predator biodiversity. Um, when we look at our microbeaters and decomposers, on the other hand, just moving from zero to one monoculture, or excuse me, zero to one cover crop you do see an appreciable increase in this uh, decomposer diversity. Whereas moving from one to four um, cover crop species, you actually don't see this significant um, increase in, in biodiversity. And so I like to point this out just because it's a way of, um, you know, thinking about how people can, or producers, people can potentially ecologically engineer um, their agroecosystems to support below ground arthropod communities that have maybe desired functions, like for example, predators and their ability for biocontrol or these microbe eaters and decomposers and their um, ability to enhance nutrient cycling. So one thing that we, you know, always like to, to, to ask after we see a, you know, shift in biodiversity or community composition is like, what about changes in ecosystem services? So are these changes in biodiversity actually translating into changes in function? Um, and we wanted to address this using a litter bag study, um, looking at how 
the um, potential for arthropod mediated decomposition changes in winter wheat or a cash crop following all of those different cover crop treatments. So we uh, basically went out to our small plots um, where we had those different cover crop treatments. We planted winter wheat in all of those plots. And then we set out a uh, litter bag study for 240 days to see how um, these different cover crop treatments potentially influence the um, ecosystem services, in this case, decomposition of the soil arthropod communities. And so this litter bag study, we had two different uh, mesh sizes, right? One that allowed arthropods to enter and access the litter and one that excluded them. So you can mm -hmm. kind of think back to that video that we just saw, it's basically the, the left and the right panels. Um, so we set that out for 240 days um, and then we recovered them and uh, we calculated the litter decay rate for each of these bags in these cover crop in winter wheat following those cover crop treatments. And you can already see, um, looking at these bags, right? The, uh, it kind of represents, it resembles the, uh, the video that we just watched here. Like with this bag is the bag that had arthropods allowed to access the litter, whereas this bag excluded arthropods from accessing the litter. All right, so here we're looking at, um, again, the litter decay rate in, of litter in winter wheat um, following all of our different cover crop treatments. And we've got uh, two different boxes here. Um, the white boxes are the litter decay rate um, when arthropods are excluded. And the blue boxes are the litter decay rate when arthropods are allowed. So right away, we can see that when arthropods are allowed to access the litter, there is a significant increase in litter decay rate. Um, we didn't really see any differences between um, litter decay rate when arthropods were not allowed to access the litter. However, when we uh, take a look at the decay rate in the bags that arthropods were allowed to access, we kind of see an interesting pattern here developing when there, are, there is an increase in litter decay in the polyculture or the uh, multi-species cover crop um, treatment, or excuse me, in the winter wheat following the multi-species cover crop treatment compared to the other monoculture treatments and fallow. Um, so again, you know, this is kind of indicating that, you know, perhaps this increase in biodiversity um, promoted by the uh, multi-species cover crop is translating into an effect um, on ecosystem services. And indeed, when we, when we look at, um, you know, the litter decay rate, uh, again, here on the y-axis, and our soil arthropod abundance in the previous cover crop treatments, and the soil arthropod diversity in the previous cover crop treatments, we're seeing a very positive correlation between litter decay rate and both abundance and diversity in the previous cover crop treatments. And when you look at the specifics here, um, for example, these green dots, this is the diversity in the polyculture treatment, and this is the abundance in the polyculture treatment. So, you know, again, it's suggesting that there's potentially some cover crop legacy effects that are happening um, that's, again, promoting this arthropod-mediated decomposition in the cash crop following um, these different cover crops. So um, I would say that's a, a pretty positive thing from a agronomic standpoint, um, and is especially important for folks out there that are using no-till or conservation till practices, because you really do need some way to, to reincorporate that litter into the soil, and arthropods are going to be a big part of that, uh, that practice. So I just want to return here at the, uh, the end of the presentation to... Um, this quote that we kind of started out with, you know, what is soil health? Well, it's this idea that we should allow the soil to work for us and not work against us, uh, excuse me, not work against it. So practices like cover cropping that can promote these arthropod uh, communities and their potential ecosystem services are, are one way that I think um, we can help the, you know, soil work for us. I'd like to share just uh, a couple of really great resources for people that are interested in learning a little bit more about this stuff, um, especially for producers out there. So this is a great handbook from the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation called Farming with Soil Life. It's, uh, you know, hundreds of pages of great pictures, great ma management recommendations, and a lot more information on um, soil biology than we can cover here today. So that's a great resource I'd encourage you to check out. And then, uh, Stanford and myself, we just published this, uh, this bulletin um, through Idaho Extension called Soil Insects and Other Arthropods and Blue Segre Ecosystems, which is a, uh, 
basically, you know, a shortened version of this, uh, this talk that we just went through. So that's again, um, available for free download on the University of Idaho Extension website. And I would encourage you to check that out. Um, just uh, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources that supported this work as well as our, um, uh, our, our great team here at the University of Idaho. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you guys for your for your time. Um, yeah, thank you. If there are any questions, just feel free to shout them out. Um, or I have a, a couple in a second. But first of all, I like to say that's a beautiful presentation. I really enjoyed. Um, I really enjoyed watching your or looking at all your graphics and stuff. That was really well done. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to nice to actually share, you know, photos of these guys, right? Because they live in yeah. the soil, so they 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 really go unnoticed, and so we have to. Yeah, I feel like that's my job is to help, uh, you know, beautiful, promote, promote them a little bit. Beautiful photography you had some really beautiful pictures there of the insects. I mean, so much better than you see some. Sometimes you see those guardian ones that have just a blurry picture of a, you know, something. You're like, I'm not really sure what that is, but it lives in the soil. So it's kind of nice to see the representation of that. Yeah, and there's um, that uh, extension bulletin as well is is packed with pictures too. So if if, if that's up your alley, I mean, yeah, definitely check. Yeah, that I out. plan to check that out too. Um, I I did have a couple of questions about your experiment when you had the land follow. Was it just that you just did it planted and allowed it to remain bare, or do you have to have do anything to keep it bare? Or yeah, great question. Um, so yes, basically we we. Um, we just didn't plant anything. So there was no like, uh, we didn't chem fallow it or anything, no tillage. Um, it was just, just remained unplanted. So there were some volunteer weeds and stuff too right. that, uh, that they didn't, you know, crop up in the, in the fallow system, but um, yeah, just unplanted. Did you have any questions there, Vern? I noticed that you turned off your mute. Well, I was just wondering uh, what the effect of pesticides are on, you know, different pesticides are on the uh, soil arthropods. Thanks for the question, Vern. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, really important. Um, so the, the amount of research of pesticide effects on soil arthropods is nowhere near as much as we know about above ground. Um, however, we do know that, uh, and this isn't research from our lab, this is um, some data generated from other labs out there. Um, one lab specifically looked at the effect of neonicotinoid seed treatments on um, decomposer, um, excuse me, decomposer soil arthropods and their ability to um, decompose litter using a litter bank study. And they found that when um, arthropods were exposed to um, neonicotinoid treated seeds that, um, or, or in fields with neonicotinoid treated seeds that they abundance of decomposers decreased as well as their ability to actually um, break down the litter decreased. So there are some negative effects, um, at least with, with seed treatments on, on these groups that we know about. Um, in terms of like herbicides, I think that's one thing that's still um, relatively unknown, at least for this region. Um, and so that's uh, definitely an area where we, we could stand to learn more, more about. Um, the effects of herbicides, but um, certain, certainly insecticides specifically and, and seed treated um, neonicotinoid seed treatments um, do have a, a negative effect on these guys. I kind of figured that. Yeah, yeah, that's one, one drawback of, uh, you know, maybe prophylactically treating all of our seed um, <laughs> that's planted is, uh, yeah, you might be losing out on, you know, potential for some of these, these free ecosystem services like decomposition. Yeah. Did, did you have any other questions? I don't think so. I enjoyed the program. Oh, I thought it was excellent. You did a, you do a very good job of presenting. It was very fascinating. Happy to happy to share and uh, you know share the share the world of soil arthropods with people. Again, I, I think this is one group that uh, maybe goes underappreciated compared to say earthworms and you know more recently the the soil microbiology. You know, with the advent mm -hmm. of DNA sequencing and stuff, uh, people really jumped on um, the soil microbe training. Obviously, they're super important, but uh, I always I always think of these guys as kind of that that in between, right? You've got the soil microbes yeah. on the small side, the earthworms on the larger side, and then there's this soil arthropod group that uh, fits in the middle.
This is definitely a group that's underappreciated. I agree with you, even when, you know, like I said, I went through entomology masters and we did not cover this group um, near like we know now. I don't think it was as studied. I did have one other question about the the predators. I thought it was really interesting that the predators require a more complex ecosystem, kind of like they do above ground. Um, that was pretty fascinating. Yeah, some similar uh, similarities there, like you just alluded to with the with the above ground world, um, which is always something that's that's fun to to find out. Um, yeah, I think that the uh, the polyculture cover crop and the you know. Um, different rooting systems probably mm -hmm. provides um, a little bit more of this habitat heterogeneity, um, which is really, really important for, for predators. Um, and so I think that, you know, just kind of speculating here, I think that might be one reason why we're seeing that, that increase in their diversity is just gives them a little bit more of a heterogeneous habitat. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, just what you said, if you had any, any different viewpoints as to different reasons why predators need it, more diversity. Yeah, I'd say that's that's definitely um, that's that would be one one speculation. Um, you know, another thing that that uh, we think about too is that um, the increase in um, uh, I didn't share these data, but the polycultures often had a higher number of detritivores or decomposers, mm -hmm. right? And these decomposers, um, their increased abundance of decomposers can act as you know. Um, potential alternative prey that are not pests necessarily, but can still support um, predator populations. So that could be another reason um, why we're seeing a, uh, an increase in predator diversity is because there's more essentially of this, this alternative food source there for them so, in, the ab in absence of pests. Yeah, so like a reservoir of food just in case. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Yes, because if you think about predator populations above ground, you know, they, they tend to crash and grow with the pest insects. But if you have a stable, some sort of stable population of insects for them to feed upon, you're going to have a much bigger, more robust predator population. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some, some trophic, trophic relationships there supported by, uh, by cover crops. Yeah, no, I found it very great. Um, very interesting presentation. Does anyone else have any other comments or questions that they want to ask, Dane? Well, thank you so much for presenting to us. 